Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. Um, I'm here at the Texas Hill, the Texas Hill Country Winery Symposium um, here in Horseshoe Bay they, at the resort. And so you may have seen my recap video of this, but I've also done a couple interviews. Um, so um, I've got, you know what, Seth, I don't remember your last name, Urbanic. Urbanic, I did know that because I looked it up. So I got Seth Urbanic here with uh, Wedding Oak uh, Winery, and he's been kind enough to sit down with me for a few minutes. We're going to talk about um, Wedding Oak and him and everything else. So, um, Seth, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody who you are, and we'll go from there. All right, thanks, Mike. Yeah, so my name is Seth Urbanic. I'm a native of Houston, Texas, uh, and I left Texas about 10 years ago and got started in the wine business up in the Finger Lakes of New York. Um, where you know, I got bit by the wine bug, as they say. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And when I left, I wasn't so sure about Texas wine. Uh, and through the various travels and industry things that I went to, I ended up running into some Texas wine folks. And they said, man, you really got to come check this out. Texas is, a, is the real deal now. And uh, so sure enough, uh, I've made my way back to my home state. Now I'm making wine in Texas. All right, awesome. So um, let's get a little background with your, with your winemaking. So, you're not, you haven't been making the wine at all in Texas. You've actually been to a few other places in the world. And some of them have some challenges, kind of like Texas, right? Right, yeah. So, I mean, where I cut my teeth was in the Finger Lakes of New York, uh, which if anyone's ever been to upstate New York, uh, you think of cold and snow. Uh, so up there, it was German-style wines, and, and I was working, you know, a lot in, in vineyard management out there uh, and, and you know, various facets of the business. And, um, yeah, it, it's challenging to grow grapes in New York. And, and uh, similarly, it's extremely challenging to grow grapes in Texas. Uh, they're just different challenges. Right, yeah. Um, so we're not going to get to the geeky stuff we just, I just went through. He was on a panel about pH. So, but in New York, you know, we're, we're talking high acid grapes, right? And high, high acid grapes, grapes yeah. German style. We're yeah. thinking crisp, dry, bright, upright, Riesling. Yeah. Uh, you know, and in Texas, uh, we've got a whole different style. So what, what kind of challenges would you say um, Texas brings that's different than the same Phoenix Lakes or some of the other places you've worked? Right. I mean, I, I think that, you know, because we do get, you know, so hot here in Texas, uh, you know, the grapes do struggle to, to ripen all the way. Uh, sometimes the grapevine just says, hey, you know what, I'm done for the year. Um, and, and so that, that's a little bit of a challenge, but I think more importantly is as grapevines uh metabolize what they're doing is they they respire off acid and, and and so the acid in texas can get really low and so that that's a challenge in the cellar uh you know forcing us to deal with some odd fruit chemistry which you know, we really have to work on right exactly and so let's talk about who you work for so give sure. us a little bit of background with wedding Oak. yeah so i, I joined wedding oak winery uh last year so um, just just over a year ago uh, Wedding Oak Winery is based out of San Saba, Texas. Uh, it's the sixth year of operation. Uh, and the thing that drew me to them um, was that you know, they use 100% Texas fruit, and they have been for a long time, uh, which is important. And they were, they were choosing the right grapes to work with as well. I mean, uh, Tempranillo, Garnacha, you know, the Spanish varietals, Rhone stuff. Um, you know, I, I think that they were using appropriate grapes to the location. Uh, and so that was attractive. And then they're also really into revitalizing small town Texas. San Sab is a really cool small town in the middle of the country. And, uh, you know, I, I thought that they had all the right ingredients to, to the recipe for a wedding wine. Okay. And um, so with, with the grapes that you're using, um, 
is is it a balance between that stuff that's uh, estate and purchase, or using that purchase, or what? What's yeah. So I mean, you know, anyone that's familiar with Texas wines at all, uh, you know, knows that grape sourcing is a challenge. So we get about half of our fruit from the Texas Hill Country, and then the other half come from the Texas High Plains. Uh, and so in the Texas Hill Country. Uh, we do have some estate vineyards, but then we also uh, work with growers and actively help them manage their vineyards. So it's not a, not a passive uh, uh, arrangement where we just get from you're actively involved in the growing steps as well. Okay, so you're you're working with your vineyard partners um, to to uh, I guess grow the grapes a certain way, and maybe they're harvesting, or you know, how, how, how dialed in are you on that, or is it? Right, so our, our, our longstanding viticulturist, Penny Adams, who's been working in Texas wine for over 30 years, uh, she's really hands-on with our growers, which is really nice for me, uh, you know, because when the wine comes, when the grapes come to the cellar, I, I can, you know, be sure that they've been, you know, well stewarded throughout the entire process, and then it's just my job to turn those grapes into good wine. Okay, and were, were you, we're gonna talk about the symposium, were you in the very first uh, seminar you came about the calendar? Right. Yes. Okay, so Penny was, was that Penny in the background? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. I was like, wait a minute, Penny, wait a minute. I, I, I remember that name. Um, so and she's kind of the authority on right. Texas wine grape growing. So, um, uh, what, so what kind of uh, wines are you, what's your range of wines are you all doing? Uh, well, so again, you know, we're, we're focusing on Spanish and Italian. Uh, varietals and some Rhone as well. But, I mean, so, okay. um, but you know anything from bright, crisp, dry, upright Albarino, all the way to you know big, bold, tannic. Uh, I, I'm personally a big fan of the Italian, so the Italian reds here in Texas. The Montepulciano is a great okay. candidate for great wine here in Texas. All right. So what what makes something like Montepulciano a great candidate for Texas versus yeah? So some other so, so when I left Texas about ten years ago, right? Uh, you know there was a lot of uh, you know French cultivar, a lot of people didn't see Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, right, yeah. and maybe those weren't ideally suited to the Texas heat. And so we kind of went through this evolution in the industry uh, where they started to see more Spanish stuff. So a lot of Tempranillo, we saw some Viognier get introduced, which is a Rhone white. Um, and now I, I think we're on the precipice of really seeing a, a third evolution happen where we see, again, some of these Southern Italian, both whites and reds, so Trebbiano, Vermentino for the whites and reds. You get Montepulciano, Ionico, Negro Amaro, and a whole host of others that right, you may yeah. never have heard of. Um, that, that make some really interesting wines, namely because they, they hold their acid despite the heat. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's one thing uh, I was going to bring up is that, um, you know, the heat and all that is, obviously Texas is hot, but Texas is big. So let's say, you know, the, the grapes you're growing in the hill country aren't necessarily the grapes that you're growing, and they could be, but maybe a different stylistic than the grapes you're growing in the back uh, right it's Right. Uh, you know, it, it's odd uh, in that respect. Uh, you, you see a lot of, of crossover between the two regions in terms of what's being grown. I think we can focus more on how it's being grown. Mm -hmm. So in the Hill Country, uh, if you've ever visited the Texas Hill Country, hot days, hot nights. Uh, and hot days and cool nights are really what are ideal for, for grape growing in general. Right. Um, so in the High Plains, we do see what they call a diurnal shift where the, the nighttime temperature does drop a little bit. And, uh, you know, so that, that's the benefit of the high plains. Whereas in the hill country, though, you don't get that diurnal shift. Um, what you do get is you get a lot of small farms. They're very hand-tended, you know, a lot of hand-picked fruit. And that attention to detail of the vineyard, um, you know, expresses itself in a, in a very different way, I think. Okay. Um, being that it is the hill country, is there, and while there's not a lot of diurnal shift, is there at least some type of, um, are the hills changing things climatically? I, I think the, the most important part, not to de-romanticize it at all, but <laughs> I, mean, I think the most important thing is, is you know, the, the hills create pockets of weather. And, and, and so especially when you think of, of frost, which most people don't think of Texas and the frost and being a problem, but, but really in, in late spring, uh, a, a, a late frost can wipe out your entire crop. And it's a big deal. So, uh, you know, kind of staying away from those pockets of low-lying ground where that frost is going to sink right. into is really important. So that, in that respect, the hills certainly do help you get up on the hillside and maybe a southern facing slope. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that can help out for sure. So, uh, opposite of like the benefit of hills and the finger lakes, because right? you don't have that under any Well, you, 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 yeah, well, yeah, and you use, you use the hillsides to your advantage to, to generate additional sun exposure. Whereas here, 
uh, you know, sometimes you're actually fighting some sun exposure because it can get too hot. Okay. And that you're probably doing some canopy management to help for sunburn and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, so in the Finger Lakes, we were removing canopy uh, in order to get more direct sunlight on the fruit. And if you did that here in Texas too aggressively, you quickly burn up your fruit. Uh, so, you know, instead, you know, we're trying to find a balance between canopy growth and like this. Okay. Um, so, uh, with, with, with the wines you're doing about wedding oak, um, is it a balance between the white and reds, or do you kind of focus on one side or the other? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I definitely say, it, it, you know, we try to create a balanced portfolio. Um, you know, for years, uh, Kenya has made some fantastic whites over there, and again, really well known for our Viognier, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then I, I'm kind of, you know, now stepping in, taking a little bit different direction. I love some of the exciting reds, again, Italian reds, I think, are, are, are a new wave of the future. And then there's some also some, some cool outliers like Petit Syrah, um, you know, even Tanat, which other people have done well with, and Arved. Uh, so there's some really cool options in the red department to maybe, uh, you know, have still some room for ex exploration. Okay. Um, and let's, let's talk about some, some winemaking stuff. Um, we're not going to get too technical because... I'll try. You guys I'll are... Try. I'll try. I'll try. We can get technical off camera, but I'm still just going to go over my head anyway. Um, though I have to say, the, the, this last session, I understood way more of all that than just the, the pH session prior to Good. And had nothing to do with the lady who had a French accent, because I've been to France twice, and one of my good friends is French, so I, the accent wasn't a big deal. For me. It, was, it was pretty high level stuff. That was high level stuff. Um, but, um, so with, it, it maybe the problem is we're not really tasting wine, so it's kind of happening that like start asking questions about your what you're doing with your oak regimen and, and aging and stuff like that, but do you have like a like, general um, style that you're, you're doing with um, aging and maybe you use the American French? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, one of the great things about wine is there's a lot of precedent. Uh, you know, that there's, you know, for example, the Spanish have been making Tempranillo with a lot of American oak uh, for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And there's probably a good reason for that. And so we've, we've done some trials in the cellar to kind of see what what the best fit are, and, so, and unsurprisingly, uh, you know, the precedent works for a reason. Uh, so, you know, yes, we, you know, I'm trying to pair up things like uh, Tempranillo with some new American oak, uh, and then maybe some of the, uh, you know, more robust cultivars from either Italy or, or France, pair them up with a little bit of new French oak as well. Just, you know, really not, not to over oak the wine for sure, but to, to lift some of that strength and character. Okay. Um, and, and with Italian varietals, they've got a history of using not French or American. You thought about using Slovenian and Hungarian. Or, so I, I, did, uh, you know, I did see Hungarian oak quite a bit in the Finger Lakes since the wines were very delicate. And, and, and you know, you don't want to overpower them, which new oak can certainly do very quickly. I think the good news is here in Texas, uh, despite the fact that acid can be a little low, we do get a lot of tannin. And, you know, that tannic dryness can be very bold. Uh, and, and I think that it can carry oak a little bit better uh, than maybe you see in some other places. Okay. Um, and do you have, like, a... I don't want to say formulate because every great wine is probably present something different. But do you have like a, an average like age of what you're going to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I generally say 12 to 18 months. I mean, obviously, the heart of any winemaker, uh, you know, I, I'm big into science and I, I love using chemistry, you know, to get, you know, fruit into its best position it can be. But then once fermentation is done, then, then that's where the art kind of comes in. Right? Right. And, and so, you know, when you're talking about uh, how long you're going to keep a wine in an oak barrel, I mean, that's all tasting. There's the, that's the only instrument you've got is your own palate. Yeah, yeah. uh, and, uh, and so you're trying to, to find, you know, you know, this is where winemaking becomes less technical, where you have to project into the future. What, you know, where, where is this wine going to be in six months or eight months or nine months? And, and you know, what's really the most appropriate? Right. And I, I kind of got that because this last session we were in, you know, we're not going to get into the, like, the science of everything, but um, it was basically a thing about acid and, and adjustments. And folks realize every winery does some type of adjustment. Okay. Um, but one of the things that um, uh, you and House of David um, do more than the other two gentlemen, which I'm going to intervene, Sergio, um, was uh, a technique called ion exchange. Um, and we're not going to get into the technicals, but um, that versus other adjustments, um, do you like that because of the, of the 
any precision with that? Or is, or, or is there precision with that? Yeah, I mean, there's certainly precision with it. You know, I guess my one of my the pieces of my winemaking philosophy is that, you know, you, you want to use the best tools available mm-hmm. to get you the best you know, fruit possible. Right. And like I was saying, in Texas, it's not like, um, you know, previous places that were maybe in Champagne where, where you, you pick, you know, a certain lot vineyard and, and you know, you, you, it's almost sacrosanct. You know, here in Texas, you know, your fruit chemistry is is difficult, so you have to modulate it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, like you said, there are other regions that where modulation adjustment is very common. They do it all the time in California. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and Texas is no different. And in fact, um, you know, it, it's almost necessary to preserve a good product. But, you know, at the same time, if you want to make that uh, adjustment is so well integrated that you, you almost would never be able to know. Right, and, and you're still trying to project the sense of place but you're not trying to cover it up. No, I you're just know. trying. You're just trying to enhance it or or adjust it so that it still presents that. Right. Well, so again, yeah. we were talking about like grape vines were spire off acid, and so they have little acid. So you know, the most common technique of adjustment is adding acid, and, and at the end of the day, it should all balance. Right. Yeah. You yeah. spired it off, and now you're just reintroducing it. And that's yeah. that's fairly common. There are, there are plenty of other adjustments made all over the rest of the wine world to get wine chemistry, where it'll be stable and enjoyable for a long period of time for the consumers. Exactly. Um, is there a, I know they're all your kids, but is there a favorite, you have a favorite grape you like to work with? Uh, Maybe not favorite one. Well, favorite you know, it, it's like so work funny work. because again, you know, before this year, I mean, I spent so much time in, in other parts of the world, mostly which were cooler. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the Texas has a, has a whole new animal. Uh, and, you know, so I only have one vintage in Texas, uh, but I mean, the one that stood out to me, uh, you know, the first year was Ionico. Um, I, I think this is, it's a great, it's really special. It's part of that third generation of Texas wine grapes that I was talking about um, that, that shows some real potential. It, it's got intensity, it's got color, it's got tannin, it's got acid, it's got all the flavor components that make what the great red wine is, you know, and, and with little adjustment, which right, is yeah. exactly what you want. And, and it's actually one of my favorite grapes. Um, it, I mean, I, I, the sun's setting and we're getting whiter and whiter here, like we're blinding down. Yeah, I, I, I might be able to touch the sun right here. <laughs> um, but um, uh, Ayanaco is one of my favorite grapes. I don't drink enough of it. Um, and I've had a couple examples of Texas ones. I haven't had the wedding note for but the ones I've had in Texas. Well, it'll be out in 2020, don't you? Know? <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the examples I have had in Texas, uh, I've, I really enjoyed. Matter of fact, um, several years ago, I went to Duke, and uh, we had one of the Ayanacos. I think every wine we did for that interview was. Uh, Italian varietals because that's one of the specialties. Um, besides Alianica, is there any other grapes that, that you kind of are excited to work with? And I mean, have worked with? Yeah, the Montepulciano, yeah. Treviano, Vermentino. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they've got a lot of potential. I'm really excited about those. So I think that's the new direction. Now, Treviano, um, Treviano, if I'm correct, now I. Hopefully my solemn learning is, is coming through. Um me out of, no, can that be a fairly neutral grape? Yeah, I, I find just the opposite. Okay. okay. You know, it's, you know, I, I do do you know some leaves stirring with it, you know, to give it a little more texture and mouthfeel. Um, but this year we did something a little extra special. We decided that what we were gonna do is we have two lots of Treviano. And uh, very fruit driven wine, uh, really nice. Uh, but we let one of the lot wild from it. Um, okay. you know, we, we intentionally said, okay, we're, we're going to let the natural yeast take over. But me being a science guy isn't always my wheelhouse of just letting it go. But, um, yeah. you know, we did uh, to see what would happen. And you know what? They made two same lot of fruit candy at the exact same time from the exact same place. Just one wild from it and one not. And they're two very different ones. Yeah. Um, I actually stopped by the table that the yeast guy and... Um, we had a little discussion and you know about yeast and we, we kind of it was like a five minute conversation because again I don't know all the science of, of, of it, but I understand you know the basics that different yeast cultures can bring out different um, different qualities of grapes and all that. It's not as I'm gonna kind of go out and it's not as like scientifically dialed in is so you've got a rebel IPA you straight in the beer over here which that's what winemakers do when yeah, everyone asks what my favorite wine is I'm like beer usually an IPA, <laughs> right? usually usually something bitter 
and, and trust me, I. By the way, man, we've been covering grapes all day. The yeah. last thing you want is more wine. But, uh, but with beer, and not to take away from it, but if I want to create a German Kolsch beer in Texas, which they do, or in Australia, I could totally do that. And you, most likely, what I could tell you is from German, well, you probably would say I was right. Whereas wine, you can't, why you can emulate the nostalgia, you maybe can't quite get that perfect, like, like, especially like maybe a Texas Chardonnay, you're not going to make it taste just like sugar. Well, and, and I think that that's why cultivar selection is so important. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, you know, over the years, we've been, you know, there have been people that have come before me that have kind of blazed this trail, you know, uh, you know viticulturalist Penny being one of them, that have uh, found, you know, what works best at what site. And then what really can withstand the unique growing climate that we have here in Texas? And right. I, I think that over the years, we've, we've started to dial that in so that, that that does develop our sense of place. Um, right. You know, Even if it is, you know, a cab, you know, a Texas cab should it, taste it, different. It can be done. Cab, it can be done. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to stick with the Italians, but, you know, it can be done. Yeah. You know, or Alianico from Texas shouldn't taste exactly like Alianico from Italy, right? And it, and it certainly yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there still be there still should be a varietal sameness. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. In our in our in our um, uh, last session, um, well, the color should have led me to believe it was a Pinot Noir. Yeah, do a little blind I, tasting. It was, bl totally it was blind. It was funny. One of the other gentlemen thought we were doing the Tempranillo because he had the Tempranillo. Pinot Noir. He had the Tempranillo. Not that he really necessarily, I don't think he necessarily thought it was Tempranillo. He assumed. But he had the, the, the sheet that said Tempranillo in front of him, but he probably used to assume. Like, what? Especially the color, I'm sure. I did too. Yeah. Um, but I felt the second line was, to my opinion, was the once I knew it was Pinot, you know, was the one that was the most varietally. Correct, I guess, a farce pinot, but a lot of people thought that the third wine was the better, was the best of the three. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, and, and granted, this is a, this is a new to me. I've really never tasted wines just like this. Yeah. I've always tasted pretty much finished wines. Right. Um, and then let's get this back to what I was talking about—the art of wine making. You have to be able to take a wine that's, that's raw, yeah, that's and, 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 and be like, all right, I can see where this is going. And, and that's an acquired skill, you know, that, that you can, again, a science guy, you can do all the chemistry you want, but that, that is definitely a little bit of the art. You have to, you have to take a wine and have a vision for its future and then realize that vision. And, and as back to your previous point is that um, understanding that, you know, your Ionico from Texas isn't going to be, you can't mold it into being an Ionico from, you know, Italy. You know, you, it, it's going to have an identity of its own as well. And I would say your work with champagne, that, that's probably one of the most difficult areas to really, I mean, over time you can predict it, but since there is vintage variation and you've either got a, uh, a non-vintage wine or a vintage wine and you've got those base wines, or, I would say the reserve wines, I mean, that, I would say that's a, that's a pretty big skill. Well, I, I think, you know, talking about the Champenois and my experience with them, uh, I almost uh, envy them because they make largely non-vintage products. So they get to blend multiple vintages together, which if there's major vintage variation, that, that gets, you know, they can produce remarkably consistent wine in most cases because of that blending power. Whereas we take a wine from a given year and make it into one. Uh, what I did learn from the French though, um, well, you know, French are, are, are certainly, you know, have their artistic moments that they were very systematic in their evaluation of wine. And that, to me, uh, was a, was a huge learning point. And then part of their systematic evaluation of wine is, is they defined the style that they wanted prior to ever getting a grape in the door. And then they got the grapes in the door, they made the wine with that target style, and sometimes they had wine that was a little too far left or a little too far right because they had hundreds of lots, mm -hmm. you know, but they're all going to be the same wine. Uh, right. And if one of the lots was a little too far left or a little too far right, they said, nope, that's not our house style. We're going to send it elsewhere. We'll sell it to yeah. other writers uh, because they had a very specific target style. And I think that winemakers have some ability to do that, including here in Texas. Yeah. Um, and somewhat related, I, I'm still bringing it back into the symposium thing. Um, today, I got to on two of those grapes. I basically got to taste the bulk wine. Like, yeah, the raw product. Yeah, the raw product, or, or as raw as you're going to get. I mean, some of the stuff was finished a little bit. Right. Some of it a couple, has a couple years of age. And that was very interesting to taste those types of things because 
this this symposium is not for people like me. This is not tech song. Um, I'm here because I want to learn. Production side. Yeah, I want to learn like this kind of production stuff, and I think it'd be, it's kind of cool to learn that. Um, so I'm geeking out on. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in seminars that are way above my my knowledge level, but I'm being exposed to things, and, and then also the trade side of things where I'm going to the tables, and I've yet to go to the closures tables because closures and yeast super like in, in trade in, in barrels. Like today's calendar thing was supposed to be a barrel essentials. And now that's, that tomorrow. that's tomorrow, but I really want to go to pest management because I was going to go to pest management tomorrow, not the calendar thing, but I'm kind of cool. I'm glad, was, I'm glad, I'm kind of glad the calendar thing was today because while I, I kind of understand what the winemaker's year is like, um, it was nice to see that in a, at least, at least on yeah, you know, it's not like the kind of thing where you know he was talking about the, the speaker was talking about the entire calendar year, the life yeah. of the winemaker, right? Know. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I think uh, you know maybe people look from the outside and think, oh, you know, harvest some grapes, pick them, ferment them, and you're done. Now, now it's a 365, 12 months a year. Oh yeah, you know, you're, you're always doing something. You know, when I when I go visit wineries, which now I have to come visit. Um, this is usually the time you're at visit because I know this is, while there's still always activity in wine, some years have more activity than others. Right. Um, and this time of the There's year, a little bit of a lull right now, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then we have what we call the Beresin vacation. Right yeah. now, grapes take your colors. The best time to get out the door, you know, take a little bit of a Apparently holiday. in Texas, you've only got three weeks. Yeah, you know. it's not long. It's not a big window. you got to <laughs> hurry up. Not a big window. Get your vacation done. And, and I, I would say one thing that I mean, you always knew that you have a drop through ground duration when you can, but I never saw like a, an actual like number involved with that. So they said it was like a 90% corrosion. Well, that was a target, I guess. Like, yeah. You don't want to do it like uh, I guess in the beginning. Right. I, I actually think, you know, a lot of the literature out there shows that you need to drop through quite a bit earlier than that. Uh, and then I think what he was referring to was just doing a final pass. A final, a final pass, yeah. yeah. The green pass, I guess he called it. I mean, you're going to do a lot of that adjusting in the vineyard a lot earlier because you're going to, he mentioned it earlier in, in that session was if you're going to start going to prune stuff when you want to prune it early because you don't want the, the, the vine to uh, waste its energy. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, our, our good culturalist Penny is an absolute pro on this stuff. And she yeah. can tell you all about how every decision you make in the vineyard is going to affect the fruit that you'll get two or three years down the line. Uh, and that's absolutely true. So all those decisions that you make in the vineyard have consequences, you know, much further down. down exactly. Down. So, um, oh, we're, we're doing all right. We've got about 10 minutes. Because okay. uh, my next interviewee is hanging out. Of, I told him to show up at 445, and we, it's 434. So we got a couple of minutes. Um, I think that's probably, we'll probably get a good point. Is there something that maybe that we haven't covered uh, about yourself or about wedding oak or Texas wine in general that you want to talk about? Well, I mean, I, th I think circling back to, again, the whole idea of, of Texans and Texas finding its identity, um, you know, that, that ended up drawing you know, me back. And I see other members of the industry of, of similar mind mindedness coming back or, or, or coming to Texas for the first time because they're excited about Texas wine. And, 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 you know, 15 years ago, that wasn't a thing. Right, yeah. Um, you know, and so my wife and I were, we were looking at all the different wine regions in the United States. Where do we want to move? Uh, and, and we ended up, you know, I, I tell the funny story that, you know, I took my wife, who's from New York, you know, I met her when I was up there, uh, but I took her to San Saba, Texas, which is ostensibly the middle of nowhere if you're not from Texas, and uh, stood her on the street corner of San Saba in July and said, hey, you want to move here? And she was like, sure, why not? She's like, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, why not? Right? Yeah. Like, you, know, you know, let's do it. You know, no more snow. Uh, sounds like a great thing. But, you know, at the end of the day, she, you know, she understood, and I understand what so many of my colleagues understand is that, that Texas wine not only has it grown uh, by leaps and bounds, but I don't think it's reached its potential yet. Uh, not yet. And, close, and yeah. uh, every year we're getting a little bit better at defining our, our, our sense of place, at defining uh, the best you know, practices and principles that we can apply in both the vineyard and the winery, uh, because it is much like New York. It's super hard to make wine here. It yeah. is uh, unforgiving. Um, it's much like the Texas climate is, is, a, is harsh, uh, and, and you know you can really get caught in a lot of trouble if, if, if you make some some really you know some mistakes that aren't aren't you know that are easy to make. Yeah. And and so you know 
as we dive this in, we're getting better and better every year. And, and, and it's, it's exciting. It's exciting for everybody. Very nice. Well, folks, we're going to go wrap this up. Um, I just want to, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with me. Um, I got to go back up there now. I mean, I've had, I've had some of the wedding oak wines. You come so, back and, up. and they're good wines. So I've had them. But usually the interview is, we're at the winery and we do all that. So um, I definitely have to make some time to come up, um, sure. spend a little time, check out the place, uh, taste the wine. Um, and check out some Ionica. Yes. I love that, I love that grape. Uh, I, got, I do have a bottle of Duke and Ionica at home. I haven't opened it up yet. I don't know why. It's not necessarily even. Well, we'll it. catch it out. Yeah, I don't. I don't need to. I don't need to hold it for like ten years or anything like that. It's going to taste great, I'm sure. Um, but, um, but yeah, um, I want to thank you so much hey, for right. for hanging out with me, uh, folks. Uh, as always, click the links above to friend me up. Click uh, click over there. You'll hit the donate button. I'll have um, uh, links down here below for um, uh, for Wedding Oak uh, if you want to check it out. And uh, we'll see everyone again next time.